Welcome back. In this series of videos, we're going to deal with the concept of fluid statics. Statics, or fluid statics, refers to fluids at rest. At the end of this section, you should be able to understand the fundamental nature of pressure. Calculate the pressure variation in a fluid at rest. Compute the hydrostatic forces on a plane and curved surface and have an understanding of the different ways to measure pressure. Okay, so what is pressure? You probably already have an intuitive sense of the concept of pressure. Here we will formalize the definition. First, pressure is the analog to normal stress in solid mechanics. Like stress, it has units of force per unit area. Pressure refers to the tendency of a fluid to apply a normal force on a surface as opposed to a shearing force. This normal force is due to the bombardment of that surface with the fluid molecules. And a very important point here is that pressure is defined at a point in a fluid. That is, if we have some sort of fluid domain here, the pressure at this point here, which we could call P1, is not necessarily the same as the pressure at P2, P3, P4, and so on. So pressure is what we call a field quantity. So it is defined in the field, which is a spatial field. So pressure is a function of x, y, and z. The question now arises. If we consider a point in the fluid, how does the pressure vary with the orientation of a surface pl or plane passing through that point? So let's consider this point here at the bottom of your screen. If we were to draw an imaginary plane here, does the pressure applied in this direction equal to the pressure, let's say, applied in this direction? The proof of this is included in your course notes, which I will be linking to in the description of this uh, video on YouTube. But what we, what we find, and this is called Pascal's Law, states that the pressure at a point in a fluid, at rest or in motion, is independent of direction. That is, if we were to call this pressure here P1 and this pressure P2, both of these pressures acting at um, this point over here at x1, y1, then we would say that P1 is equal to P2. So Pascal's law states that evaluated at a point, the pressure is the same in all directions. And this is a very important finding. And if you're interested in the proof of this, please do consult uh, your notes. Okay, next we seek to answer some questions about the pressure variation in space. And again, I want to emphasize that this is a pressure variation in space of a fluid that is at rest. In particular, we seek to answer two questions. What is the pressure variation in a fluid which has low density? Conversely, what is the pressure variation in a fluid of high density? Let's seek to answer the first question. So here we have a free body diagram of a low density fluid. Okay, so we have our coordinate system here of x, y, and z. 
and I'm not showing the out of plane uh, forces, the pressure forces uh, in the x direction, but they are there. So here we see forces in the y direction and forces in the z direction. So here we have an element of fluid with a certain pressure at the center of that element. So what this is saying here is that at the top of this element, we can say that the pressure at this, the top, uh, on the top surface is equal to the pressure at the center plus the variation in the z direction multiplied by the distance of that variation. So this second term here, this delta p, um, this partial of p with respect to z multiplied by delta z over 2, will give us units of pressure. And then recall that pressure is a force per unit area, so we are multiplying it by the area on which this pressure acts. So we have sides of delta x and delta y, which corresponds to these two edges over here. Similarly, on the bottom surface, instead of p plus the, the variation in the positive z direction, we'll have p minus the variation in the z direction of the pressure. And this is what we see here at the bottom. So again, this is not a full free body diagram because we are not showing the pressure forces acting in the x direction, but please <clears throat> remember that they are there. You might ask yourself, well, where is gravity? Shouldn't we have a body force included there? Well, here we're considering a fluid with very low density. So we could say that the density is roughly equal to zero. Recall that the mass is equal to the density of the fluid multiplied by the volume. And remember that the gravitational force will be equal to the mass times the gravitational acceleration. Therefore, if the density is approximately equal to zero, and this is obviously a relative term between different fluids, then we can assume that the body force due to gravity is also equal to zero. So we draw a free body diagram. Now it's time to apply Newton's second law. So let's focus on the force balance in the z direction, which would state that the sum of the forces in the z direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the z direction. So what are the forces in the z direction? Well, we have the force on the bottom surface and the force on the top surface over here. So let's write this out. And note also that the force on the bottom surface is acting in the positive z direction, and the force uh, on the top surface is acting in the negative z direction. So if we assume that positive is up uh, uh, is uh, upward in the z direction, as would be suggested by our coordinate system, then we would write first the uh, force. on the bottom surface because it is acting in the positive z direction and then minus the force on the top surface acting in the negative z direction all right and this will be equal to our density multiplied by the volume, multiplied by the acceleration in the z direction. We can describe this volume here as being equal to delta x, delta y, delta z. Note that the pressure terms in the first and second bracket will cancel. So we have a pressure multiplied by an area minus a pressure multiplied by that same area. So these two terms 
will cancel out. So what we are left with will be minus the partial derivative of z multiplied by the volume delta x delta y delta z and that will be equal to our right hand side which is a mass times an acceleration so we have the density multiplied by the volume which we have said would be delta x delta y delta z multiplied by the acceleration So note that these volumes will cancel out, but also we've said that the density is approximately equal to zero. Furthermore, if the fluid's at rest, there would be no acceleration. So what we are left with is the pressure variation in the z direction is equal to zero. In fact, for the conditions considered, that is, those of a low density fluid at rest, we can also say that the pressure variation in the x direction is equal to the pressure variation in the y direction and the pressure variation in the z direction, and they are all equal to zero. Thus, we conclude that unless acted on by another force, the pressure throughout a low density fluid at rest remains constant. So what this means is that, let's say we have a container which is closed and it is filled with some, some gas, let's say air or whatever it is. Then what we can say is that we can say that the container as a whole has an internal pressure of P. That is the pressure variation at this point here, P1, will be the same as the pressure at P2, P3, P4. Okay, so for a low density fluid, such as a gas, which is at rest, we can assume that the pressure is constant throughout. Okay. Now we turn our attention to the pressure variation in a high density fluid. That is, what if we can no longer ignore the effect of gravity? So that means that we are saying that the density is no longer equal to zero. So I've reproduced the same free body diagram that we looked at for a low density fluid. So we still have the pressure forces on all faces of the elemental fluid. But in addition, we need to add another force. This additional force will be a body force included at the center of the element, the fluid element. And this is the force due to gravity. This gravitational force can be expressed as the specific weight multiplied by the volume, delta x, delta y, delta z. Recall that this specific weight is equal to the density multiplied by the gravity. So a density multiplied by a volume will give us a mass multiplied by a gravitational acceleration. So this is our familiar form for the, uh, the weight of a body. So once again, let's have a look at our force balance in the z-direction. And again, we assume that the positive direction is up. So once again, we will be left with the negative of the partial of p with respect to the partial, uh, partial P over partial Z multiplied by 
delta x, delta y, delta z. And this is from just looking at this minus this. And so what we're left with is just the partial terms over here. But in addition to this, we're going to have minus the specific weight multiplied by the volume. And this will be equal to the mass times the acceleration. So the mass is a density multiplied by a volume multiplied by the acceleration. So we see here that the volumes all cancel out. Furthermore, for a fluid at rest, the acceleration is going to be equal to zero. So what we find is that the pressure variation in the z direction is equal to negative rho g. So the change in pressure is equal to negative rho g. But what is the pressure field? That is, what is the relationship between pressure and position z? First, what we'll do is that we'll note that, similar to a fluid of low density, we have the partial with respect to x is equal to the partial with respect to y, and both of these are equal to zero, because nothing has changed in those directions. Okay, there's no acceleration in the x and y direction, and we have an, the body force, which is due to the weight, is only being applied in the z direction. So what this means is that we can replace the partial derivative of p with respect to z with just a normal derivative. So what this states is that the pressure only varies in the z direction. It does not vary in the x or y direction. So we can replace the partial with just a normal derivative. Okay, so we have dp by dz is equal to negative rho g. Now we can integrate this in the z direction. And what we are left with is the pressure is equal to negative rho g z plus a constant of integration. And this is the important result of this section, which states that the pressure in a high density fluid varies linearly in the z direction. So what assumptions did we make in this integration? Well, firstly, we assumed that the density is constant. It was taken out of the integral. This is a reasonable assumption in many cases. So recall that if the density is approximately equal to, cons uh, to a constant, then we say that we have an incompressible fluid. Therefore, for a fluid like water, for example, we would note a pressure variation of this form. We will look at a few examples in the next video.